What's up, guys? Doug Polk here, and we're back with another episode of... You know what? I know why you're here. You know why you're here. Let's just do this shit. Doug finally wakes up with a monster. They gave him a real hand. Look at that. This is not fair. You give the best player in the world a good hand? Our hand begins with being dealt pocket queens and facing an open and a call. Now, when you have queens and you're up against a couple of loose opponents, you want to make sure to three bet to build the pot. You're going to be able to put yourself in a position where you have a great hand in position against some wide ranges, and I know that this is not why you're here, is it? Okay. Let's jump into why you're actually here. Someone has like 8k and like, damn, I got jam. I said, like, if they always call, I just like, <laughs> I just <Breaking> print. <laughs> oh. You guys are wondering who's on commentary. It's Matt Avoid the 9 to 5 and me, upswinging JJ, JJ De La Garza. We're letting Doug Polk take it away for us since it is Doug Polk week. Alex Rally with Pocket Jacks. 325, I'm sorry. Raise. 1,025. And we have a three bet from Doug with 8-6 suited. Tom Duan's hand. He is known for destroying people with the 8-6. And Israeli Ron with ace-queen off in the big blind. Tough decision for him. He hasn't really had too many hands to gamble with. He really wants to get in there. You have Alec Torelli opening and Doug Polk three betting on the button and you have ace-queen off suit in the I'm big mucky. blind. <laughs> I'm I'm out of there. Yeah, he was fun to fold there. <laughs> it's a pretty nasty spot. Ouch. Playing that hat out of position in a three-bet pot as a cold three-bet caller is tough enough. And then to have those two in the pot with you is probably not a big win situation. You can't just rely on your post-flop skill there, no? Not against them. Notice that Doug three-bets this one and goes silent, but this time he's bluffing. Good balance there from Doug on the loudness. I noticed earlier when he flops in big hands, he was very quiet. This time, 86. <laughs> Alec Torelli clearly not folding, just deciding whether he wants to four better call. 9,000 behind, 1,500 in the pot. 10,000 behind, excuse me. And here we go to the flop. Now, we were playing 2550, but this hand has been straddled up to 100, which is why Alec Torelli comes in from a, for a raise from under the gun plus one with pocket jacks. The action then folds to me on the button with 8-6 suited. Now, when you're in position, you generally want to mix in some three bets with hands like 8-6 suited because that way, post-flop, you can have some draws, you can have some bluffs, you can have some hands that can bluff on different streets, and it balances out your three bet range. If you only do it with strong hands like ace-king or ace-queen or high pairs or suited broadways, while those will make more money because they are better hands, it doesn't balance out your range post-flop so you can have some bluffs in different situations. So we make it 1,025 to go here on the button with 8-6 suited. The action then folds to Israeli Ron the big blind who looks down at ace-queen and this is a tough spot. To be totally honest with you, I don't really mind any of his options. Personally, I think a very small sized 4-bet to around 2.2-2.3 thousand looking to fold to a jam is a very reasonable play. If I have a hand like Ace, King, or Jacks Plus, then yeah, he's going to get a lot of action and have to fold his hand. But if I am bluffing or I have some kind of suited Broadway, I'm probably either going to fold or take a flop. And if I do decide to call, his hand's probably going to over-realize because it's going to look like he has Aces or Kings. So I like the idea of mixing in a 4-bet, but I don't hate the idea of folding. Against conservative players, folding seems reasonable. Back over to Torelli with Jacks, and now he has two options. He can either call or 4-bet. Typically, I think calling tends to be the better play because realistically, if you get this much money in with jacks, you're at best flipping and then you're going to be really dominated a bunch of times. So I like his decision to call and we take a flop. A7 deuce slows down probably both players. I'm not sure if I Doug is continuing without any draws besides a backdoor straight draw. You could rather check back 8-6 of diamonds and fire a C-bet with the 8-6 of clubs here. Check check is also fine, obviously, but Jax is pretty nasty on this flop just because an ace constitutes around 40 to 50% of your distribution. So you went from the top 20% of your range with Jax, top 10, top 20, and now you're in the top 50 or 60th percentile. Usually when you check and you get faced with, what is that, 1,500? 1,250? So you're going to want to fold like 40% of your range in this spot. So Jax is just going to be a check call on the flop and usually going to be a fold on either the turn of the river. 
Nasty when you fall that much in your distribution, though. Wow, and he goes for a check call. The flop comes a7 deuce with two spades, and Torelli checks over to me on the button. With 8-6 of clubs here, this hand makes a nice flop bet for several reasons. First off, you don't block any of the flush draws, so while that might get you less folds here, on later streets, it's going to be a nice hand to have, because when you don't block those draws, he has more hands that can call and then fold on later streets. Additionally, if the turn comes a 10, 9, 6, sorry, 5, or 4, I'm going to have a straight draw that can keep barreling. So this hand's a nice way to balance out your flop bet range with some flush draws, some backdoor flush draws, some wheel draws like 5-4 suited, and then additionally your value range like ace-king, ace-queen, maybe some ace-jack, as well as a few hands like ace-2 suited or ace-7 suited if you're planning on 3 betting those hands. So this is a nice way to try and balance that range out and give you some playability on different runouts. Back over to Torelli, and he has a very easy call here with jacks. Not only is he ahead of a lot of bluff hands like wheel draws or 8-6 suited or flush draws, but additionally has a spade in his hand, which will give him some playability on turn spades. So he decides to call, and we take a turn. This is the kind of spot where you want to rely on GTO fundamentals to hold you against a very aggressive, very good player. Jax. He's, fo he's folding around like 40% of his range on the flop, and so because of that, Jax has now fallen in his distribution much more. He's probably in the bottom 30 to 40% of his range now. And this just turned out to the battle of the YouTubers. They both have poker YouTube channels that are both phenomenal, battling heads up. We also know Alex capable of making hero calls. 8,000 behind, 5,000 in the pot. Doug going for the two barrel here. And he's betting really big with a bunch of 1K chips. 3175. The turn comes a three, creating a backdoor flush draw, and Torelli checks. Now on the button with a6 suited, I have a pretty interesting decision, and I think that you can take one of two lines. You can either bet here and plan on barreling brick rivers, or you can check and mainly plan on giving up, although you can work in a few hands to bet check bet river as well. Here's why I ultimately decided why I liked betting the turn. I want to have some bluffs that make sure to not block any of the hands Torelli might call, call fold. Now, diamonds are also great bluff hands because in general, Torelli is not going to float under the gun plus one with diamond hands facing a turn bet. But spades don't make very good triple barrels, because if I have spades in my hand and go three streets, my opponent is less likely to have flush draws that can call, call, and then fold the river, which I really want him to do. So the question becomes, what's my value range? And my range looks something along the lines of ace-king, ace-queen, ace-deuce suited, 5-4 suited, maybe occasionally ace-seven, but I'd probably lean towards fighting that preflop. So I definitely have a large, uh, large amount of uh, value bets, and the question is how many bluffs do I have? Well, I certainly have a bunch of flop flush draws, although I would be putting some of those into my flop check range, like the higher flush draws. Diamond's hands are certainly hands that I would bet the flop with, with like 8-6 of diamonds, or 9-6 of diamonds, or 6-5 of diamonds. 6-4 of diamonds, if I did 3-bet preflop, I would absolutely bet the turn, so I have a wide range of those hands to bet as well. But here's the thing, if I pick only hands like diamonds, I'm not going to have enough hands to bluff with given my value range. I'm going to have a lot of good hands here. I'm going to have 9 combos of ace-king, or rather sorry, 12 combos of ace-king, 12 combos of ace-queen, and then 4 combos of 5-4 suited, 3 of ace-deuce suited. So we've got a lot of value combos, and if we only pick out those bluffs with diamonds in them, and then spades to give up river, we're probably not going to end up bluffing with enough combinations. So what that means is we have to take some hands that are not very good and triple barrel them, or else we're not going to bluff enough. Now the real question here is, do I 3-bet 6-4 suited preflop? Because if I do, I should probably not use 8-6. If I have 6-4 suited, then I have 6-4 and 6-5 suited, as well as diamond hands, and that's probably going to be just enough hands that I want to bluff with. However, I think there's some chance I would not be about 6-4 suited on the button for an under-the-gun plus one range and full ring. I think I would probably lean towards maybe a mix of raising or folding, in general not 3-betting all the time. So the question becomes, can I barrel off with some hands like 8-6 that don't block anything, or am I going to just get called down too light? In general, I don't worry too much about what my opponent's up to, and I try and pick hands that make a lot of sense given my strategy. So I fire the turn looking to barrel off on a variety of rivers where everything bricks. 31.75, about 70% pot. Yeah, so this is a really tough spot for Alec. I mean, this is definitely on the line. I think against a lot of players, especially tighter players, you're going to want to fold the turn here. Against somebody like Doug Polk, though, on the button, it's tough to let it go. 
And he does make the big call here. Alec with the right read. Wow, so Two jacks. sick now. Can Doug Polk find a triple barrel here? On the turn with jacks, you have a crystal clear fold. When you have jacks in this situation, while it is a hand that does have some showdown value and you definitely can be bluffs, there's a lot of things going on that aren't favorable for you. First off, you have a spade in your hand, which is a card you would much prefer to have your opponent have because if they have a spade, they're likely going to be back this turn as a bluff and you now block those hands. Additionally, while you do block a hand like Ace Jack, that hand likely is going to check flop or check turn, so it's not really too relevant compared to if you had a hand like Queens, where you'd block a lot of Ace Queen combos, which is certainly important. Now, I will say on the turn, when you have a hand like Jacks, if you're going to call, you should be looking to call some rivers, or else what can you really hope for? Particularly when you're playing against aggressive opponents, you're going to get barreled a lot in the river, so you kind of have to put your foot down if you do decide to call. Here's the thing, there is a big difference between having an ace on the turn and having a jack. When you have an ace, you block a bunch of the hands your opponent can have for value, like ace, king, or ace, queen. And so there's very strong removal effects in play. In fact, just having an ace between ace, king, ace, queen, and ace, deuce, and maybe ace, seven, or ace, three, depending on the way your opponent plays the button, you're going to block something around seven, eight, or nine combos of different value bets. So the big problem with jacks is that you block bluffs and you don't block value, which makes it one of the worst hands to call on the turn. There are a few worse hands I can think of like eights or nines or tens but in general it's towards the bottom when your opponent bets two-thirds before its pot you want to try and categorize your range efficiently to try and deal with the aggression now i think torelli might just think i'm up to no good let's see what happens on the river anything on the river now i think alex in the stone nut low of his distribution except for two spades in his range king is really not the most dangerous card unless doug's just firing in the two barrel with the king queen of spades or a hand like that and that would go check check on the river here. So when Doug does bet the river, he's not afraid of the king. But Alec is just so low in his range. What does he beat? He only beats three bet air. Bet, bet, bet. That's it. That's the only thing he beats. And Doug also knows it. And he's at the bottom of his range. And when you're at the bottom of your range, that's when you should be bluffing. Here it comes. 5,000 behind, 11,000 in the pot. Boom. Big bet. He will have to call for his remaining chips here. He does put Alec all in. Can... Alec, find the hero call and put Doug on the 86 well, here. He bets 6,300, and it seems like Alec has around 11K left. Our graphics are a bit off. The river comes an offsuit king, which is a pretty neutral card for both players. It's unlikely Torelli is going to be calling Prevot with Ace King, so it's not too relevant when you think about it like that. But also for the button, while this can improve me to two pairs with Ace King myself, it's not as likely now that I have Ace King because of card removal. I went from having 12 possibilities on the turn to only 9 on the river. This means that when I bet the river to this large size, I'm representing a more polarized range than I was on the flop return, but that's also standard. As you get closer to the river, your bets become more polar. When I bet here with 8-6 suited, we're, we're suffering from some of the same problems we talked about on the turn. How many diamond hands do we have to bluff with? How many non-equity hands do we really have to pick from? Do we have 6-5 suited? Do we have 6-4 suited? And really, at the end of the day, it's going to be relatively close. If you ended up bluffing with 8-6 suited here all the time, you'd likely be over bluffing, particularly if you have some of those 6-4 combos preflop. But if you are giving up the river with spades and you're not 3 betting hands like 6-4 suited preflop, well, then it really becomes rather reasonable. Yeah, it's better to bluff with 6-5. Yeah, it's better to bluff with 90 to diamonds, but we can't always just try to only pick out when we have really good bluffs. In fact, one thing in poker people tend to do way too much is under bluff because they're scared. They're afraid they're going to look bad and that it's going to make them look like they don't know what's going on and they bluff with a bad hand. Well, here's the bottom line. I'm going to have a bunch of value combos here. I'm going to have ace-king, I'm going to have ace-two suited, I'm going to have 5-4 suited for sure. And all of those hands are going to want to triple off. So the question becomes, do I want to use diamonds and some non-equity? And if the answer is yes, this is one of my best hands to use. It had a lot of playability across different turns and rivers that, admittingly, I didn't hit. But past that, I don't block either the spades or the diamonds that can call call fold. I don't think the diamonds are too relevant because we're looking at an under-the-gun plus one range against a button three bet, so it's not too relevant compared to maybe heads up situations, but the point still remains that makes it a nice call. 
Additionally, it's pretty reasonable for the player under the gun plus one if you had a hand like ace five, ace four, fives or fours to go call, call, fold, and maybe not blocking those hands either has some, rel has some relevance too. At the end of the day, when I was in the situation, I felt like this hand had to be added in to make my range balanced. And sometimes you just have to pull the trigger and hope it gets through. Over to Torelli facing this $6,000 river bet, and jacks all of a sudden aren't looking too good. But there's a couple of things that are okay about calling with jacks here. First off, it's not too likely if your opponent's good, they're going to take those spade hands and turn them into barrels because they block hands they want their opponent to fold. So I don't think the fact he has the jack of spades ends up being too relevant. In fact, the reason it's such a bad call is because of the turn. The turn call here with jacks seems not very good. On the river... It's not good, don't get me wrong, he should much prefer to have an ace, but at least he doesn't have negative removal effects when considering his range. Now here's the problem I have with calling jacks on the river. You have a bunch of hands with aces in them, ace-queen, ace-jack, ace-ten suited, ace nine suited, maybe some low suited wheel hands as well, not to mention sets. In these tight range situations, you typically don't need to throw in hands like jacks because frankly you have enough calling hands already. I do think the worst line he could take here with Jax is call, call, fold, because if you do that, what were you really hoping to have happen on the river against players that have high barrel frequencies? But he should probably stick to just calling with an ace. I mean, I guess maybe he had a read. He's still thinking about it. No, he's reaching. Oh no, my gosh. my God. No, wait. Whoa! Oh, my God. He calls. Oh, my God. <laughs> What a call! Wow. What a call! What a call! Wow! Oh, oh my gosh! Wow! Oh, wow! Oh that my was the most god! Insane hand yes. I've ever I've, I've ever commentated on. Wow! I've seen some sick ones. Man. Luckily, here at Poker Hands Productions, we of course have access to behind-the-scenes footage that not everyone has access to, and we have a clip of what Torelli was actually thinking during the hand. Sometimes in poker, you're going to get owned. There's no way around that. But what matters is how you take that and move forward. You can't be afraid to sometimes get called down and have nothing. In fact, if you're never getting called down where you have nothing, you're probably simply not bluffing enough. So make sure to have that in your game and don't be afraid to fire that third barrel. Doug's had about enough of the uh, chatter. He wants to get down to brass tactics. Okay. 25 systems. Alex snap folds nines. And uh, maybe next time they just make a huge fold right there on the flop. Thank you for joining me here today for Poker Hands. And as always, hit that subscribe button and join the empire.